welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, and it's time for our last listener support special from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and follow us on Instagram at Great Detectives. And you can participate in our listener support campaign by becoming one of our ongoing Patreon supporters. For as little as $2 per month, just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, we're going to do something that we did during our spring campaign, and that was well-received, and bring you a twice-told tale where we play uh, a uh, radio script from one series and another series later on that did the exact same story. We see what differences were made, what changes were made, and how different stories work with different characters and actors. And we're going to start off with The Saint, starring Vincent Price. This episode originally aired July the 30th of 1950, and the title is The Case of the Previewed Crime. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as The Saint. Templar? Mr. Templar. I'm asleep. Mr. Templar. Noisy dream. You're not dreaming, Mr. Templar. That's what you say. I'm alone in my bedroom. I'm in bed. It's dark. Oh, but you're not alone. I'm here. Go away. I'm sorry. I didn't climb into your bedroom in the middle of the night merely to go away again. What did you expect? A 21-gun salute? I expect your attention. You can't see me, can you? No, I'd be even happier if I couldn't hear you. But I can see you, however... You're silhouetted against the window behind you. That was cunning of me. It helps me aim the gun I'm pointing at you. I'm so glad. I'd hate to have your aim suffer. What do I do now? Get up, put the lights on, You don't do anything of the kind. No? Why? Are you shy? Yeah. Let's say I'm shy. (laughs) That's why you insist on holding this conversation with me in the dark. A conversation, obviously, that wouldn't be about the weather. What would it be about? Well... I'm a writer. A writer and shy? Nonsense. I need some advice. The only advice I can give all writers is don't. I'm writing a book about murder. I'm calling it The Story of a Perfect Crime. Sounds interesting. Thank you. What I came here for was to have you tell me whether or not the murder my book deals with is really a perfect crime. Go on. The man to be murdered, in my book, that is, suffers from heart disease. He's a completely unpleasant character, a financier and a crooked one. A man who deserves to die. Mm -hmm, And he suffers from heart disease. For this condition, he takes daily at stated hours capsules containing medicine. Capsules upon which his life depends. Now then, the murderer, in my book that is, decides to poison the financier. Oh, that's not cricket. No, it's murder. Murder that will be poisoning without poison. I'm waiting breathlessly for the next chapter. The murderer steals one of the capsules, pours the medicine out, and replaces the medicine with powdered sugar. He returns the capsule to the financier's pillbox. In due course, the financier reaches the capsule, takes it. His weak heart, lacking the medicine he needs, fails. And there you have poisoning without poison. Mmm, very ingenious. (laughs) I think so. The poisoner can't be traced through the poison he purchased because he didn't purchase any. The murdered man is assumed to have died a natural death. An autopsy will show no poison in his body since there wasn't any. (laughs) Well, is it a perfect crime? I can't see any flaws in it. Good. 
And if you can't, I don't imagine the critics will. Don't you mean the uh, police? The police. Why should the police be interested in a book I'm writing? Why should the critics be interested in the murder you're committing? You're not serious. You are. I... I rather think I must leave now. Be getting light soon. No, no, don't move. I still have the gun pointing at you. If I had to shoot you, it wouldn't be a perfect crime, but you'd be dead nonetheless. (laughs) But that wouldn't interest you, would it? Well, good night, Mr. Templer, and, uh... Pleasant dreams. Thanks. Loads. Coffee? Your toast, Mr. Templer. And the morning paper. Oh, thank you. Uh, you're up early this morning, aren't you? I, uh, I couldn't sleep. Hey... Any resemblance between this toast and toast is purely coincidental. What does your chef do, tan the stuff? Oh, no, Mr. Templer. He we... probably uses old shoe leather. Hey. What's the matter? Don't you like the headlines? Can't say that I do. Frank A. Clark, noted financier, dies of heart attack as police arrest him for alleged embezzlement. Oh. Was he a friend of yours, Mr. Templer? No. But he was a financier. He was crooked. And he had a weak heart. <laughs> no wonder he died when he got arrested. Depends on whether he took medicine in uh, capsules. What depends on that, sir? Murder, my friend. Murder. Taxi! Hey, taxi! I... Oh, no, Louie. Oh, yeah, Louie. Out of all the taxi cabs in this city, why do I keep getting yours? Out of all the fares in this city, why do I keep getting you? You have a point there. I'll go right home and shop. You'll stay where you are. You want to go home with me? No. What's the matter with my home? Nothing. I I... live there, don't I? My wife lives there. My kids live there. You have no children. Don't get personal. I'm sorry. Man spends every spare minute he's got hoping. Louie. Did Julius Caesar have children? Did Alexander the Great have children? Did Napoleon have children? Yes. Me, they didn't send an announcement to. Louis, will you please drive me to 1893 Waterview Drive? I'm in a hurry. Okay, okay. 1893 Waterview Drive. Who lives there? A gentleman named Frank A. Clark. Except that he doesn't live there, Louis. He's, uh, dead there. You're going to keep company with a corpse, Mr. Templer? I am going to visit his surviving relatives, if any. Why? Does it occur to you that it might be none of your business? Sure. It's none of your business? Well, now that we got that clear, why are you going to visit his relatives? Louis, stop the car, quick. Oh. Do I stop? What happened? We've reached 1893 Waterview Drive. Oh, I'm careless about little details like that. <laughs> Here, Louis, and don't forget to mention it to your income tax collector. I'll write to him. Hey, don't you want me to wait? No, but you will, Louie. You will. Hello. Hello there. Hello. Uh, This is the Clark home, isn't it? Sure, and I'm a Clark niece. And you're... Simon Templer, uh, an old friend of your uncle's. You're not old. (laughs) Well, I... And you're not a friend of my uncle's. Come in, anyway. Oh, thank you. Because maybe you can be a friend of mine. Oh. In here. Uh, uh, tell me, uh, do you need a friend? No, but I like them when they're as tall as you. And Oh, my name is Inez. Inez Francis. I'm very glad to know you, Miss Francis. You probably won't be when you really get to know me. Mm-hmm. I realize perhaps I shouldn't have come today. You must be all broken up by your uncle's death. Who, me? Well, perhaps the family. Well, that's me. I'm the family. Your uncle must have been a lonely man. No, he didn't mind. He had me in the market and all those people he was swindling. Oh, and of course he had Mr. Hartzell and Charlie Melvin. Who are Hartzell and Charlie Melvin? Charlie's sort of a weedy youth. Uncle's secretary, very anemic. I ignore him. And Hartzell? Uncle's lawyer. 
that I fondly suspect is bigger crook as Uncle was. But very spatted, you know. Spatted? Uh Uh-huh. On the shoes. And gardenia in the buttonhole. And I've a sneaking suspicion, whiskeyed in the liver. How untidy. Uh, Nobody else close to Uncle? Nope. Then it boils down to one of you three. What does? Who's happy now that Uncle's dead? I am, Hartzell is, Charlie is. Uh, That covers the field. Why? Uncle had a lot of money. I get it now. Hartzell stole some money from Uncle. He won't go to jail now. Charlie was implicated in Uncle's crooked deal. Charlie won't go to jail now. Mm. And uh, who has a a deep, slightly hoarse voice? I don't. No. Which means that you're not the one who came to my room last night. No, but if you ask prettily, perhaps I'll come tonight. I know. Look at your etchings. (laughs) I don't have any hedging. I'll bring some with me. Um, are the others around? Mm-hmm. Sitting around practicing grief-stricken looks for the funeral. That happy event is this afternoon. I'd better get dressed for it. But you are dressed. Uh, but not for a funeral. Would you excuse me for just a minute? Oh, of course. Oh, <laughs> oh here you are, Nurse. Greetings, Mr. Templer. This is Charlie. Charlie, this is Mr. Templer. Glad to meet you. How do you do? He doesn't. Entertain Mr. Templer for me, Charlie. I've got to find a dress that's sad-looking. I'd like to stay and entertain you, but um, I've got to hurry. You see, I'm Mr. Clark's secretary. In his condition, he doesn't need a secretary. (laughs) Well, I'm Mr. Clark's former secretary. No, no, I'm the former Mr. Clark's... No, I get it now. Relax. Oh, I'm relaxed. Then why are you in such a hurry? Well, I have to go out and hire some mourners, haven't I? Why? Well, it wouldn't look nice if there were only three of us at the funeral. I knew as Mr. Hartzell and myself. No, especially since you'll all be grinning from ear to ear. May I ask you a question? Of course. Has your voice ever been deeper? Deep? <laughs> Heaven, no. <laughs> Ta-ta. Goodbye. Charlie, my boy. Or is he my boy? Oh, this... Oh, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, my name is Templer, and I'm... Uh, Hartzell is my name. I- I'm sorry. I-, I can't talk to you now. I'm in a hurry. Why? Uh, my tailor's expecting me. Your tailor? You'd hardly expect me to attend Mr. Clark's funeral in this, would you? Impossible. Uh, you see? Uh, so, if you don't mind, I'll just run along. Oh. Yes? What are you doing here? Looking for a man with a deep voice. Oh, sorry. Mine isn't. But why are you looking for a man with a deep voice? He told me how Mr. Clark was murdered. Well, that explains it. What? Yes, he was murdered. But but Mr. Clark died of heart failure. Indeed. You must be... I I demand an explanation immediately. You've forgotten one thing, Mr. Harper. What's that? Your tailor is waiting. But I... And tailors are sometimes very temperamental. Besides, we can discuss this some other time. This evening? This evening. Uh, Here's my card. I'd appreciate your coming. If Mr. Clark was murdered, something must be done about it. Something will be. Who knocks at my gate? Enter. Ah, <laughs> Templar, as I live on sufferance and breathe with difficulty, Templar. <laughs> Hello, Desmond. <laughs> what happy winds were off to hither, Simon the Subtle? Uh, Desmond, I'm not an audience. Oh, Templar, I'm an old ham. Contrary to what they say, hams do not improve by aging. Still the gay adventurer? Well, I'm not especially gay at the moment. Murder. Oh, the last murder that was of any interest to me was that Elsinore thing. You know, when Claudius and Gertrude put their heads together and slipped Gertrude's royal husband a slug of poison in the ear. I remember it well. And the fat prince, uh, uh, Hamlet, I think his name was, Mooned about like a ninny, sending Ophelia to a watery grave and the rest of the cast to a most bloody one. <laughs> you you would have made a good Hamlet. Bless you! Oh, I, I wanted to play Hamlet. Instead, they preferred me as a ventriloquist, confound them. That's why I'm here. You've been a ventriloquist. Uh, I'm involved in a case which hangs on the identity of a voice. Desmond... Could anyone change his voice so that it would be completely different from his real voice? Oh, yes. But you'd always know that the second voice wasn't natural. That does it, then. Does what, Simon? Look, Desmond, three people wanted a man named Clark dead. Clark is dead. Presumably, therefore, one of the three killed Clark. Yes. Now, I was told of the method whereby Clark was going to be killed by a very distinctive voice in the dark. Therefore, the problem was simple. Find which of my three suspects had a voice like that and... 
go on from there. Well? Not one of the three has that kind of voice, which leaves me with an interesting problem, but leaves the murderer free to go on murdering. <laughs> I want the nearest bookstore. You can't have it. It belongs to a guy named Pestlefleet. Will you please drive me there quickly? Okay. What's the matter? Suddenly decided you want to curl up in front of a fire with a good book? Uh, for that, I'd rather have Inez. Uh, no, Louie, I merely want to find out how a man can die of poisoning without being poisoned. <laughs> bookstore very long. What's the matter? He didn't like Pestle Flake? Uh, he didn't have the book I wanted. I know a place. Uh, not that kind of book, Louis. What I wanted was a book on heart diseases. Oh, light reading, huh? Interesting. Heart diseases? These stores had one book on heart disease in stock until yesterday. So? Yesterday, the book was sold to a man, Pestle Thwaite told me, who behaved in a strenuously agitated fashion. A man named Hustle. Maybe the name was bothering you. Which reminds me, where am I taking you? Naturally, Louis, to a man named Hartzell. Hartzell in or uh, on his way to Mexico or... Uh... In. Mr. Templer. Yes, Mr. Hartzell. Hey, come in, come in at once. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm jittery. That, that funeral this afternoon. I see. Well, have you tried reading? It's very soothing. I have no patience with books. Now, uh, please tell Not even books on heart disease? Hmm? Oh, why? Uh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, yes, Inez. What? Oh, how dreadful. Oh, yes, at once. Goodbye. Well, you're pale. I'm shocked. Charlie Melvin. You know him? Mr. Clark's secretary. Yes, well, it seems that something's happened to him. Why? He's dead. <laughs> Tell him to hurry, her temper, hurry. Oh, we're almost there. Mr. Hartzell, did Arnaz say who discovered the body? Oh, yes, she did. She'd been visiting some friends, returned home, and... Couldn't have been an accidental death. Coincidence doesn't stretch that far. You know, if he was murdered... You still think the police believe Clark was murdered, too? Not the police, me. Oh, Mr. Hartwell. Oh, Siren. <laughs> Hello, Anna. Uh, come in. Getting to be embarrassing, all the sudden death. It might be more than embarrassing. It might be fatal. It was, but Charlie... How did it happen? He shot himself. The police have... I you... just phoned oh, them. Well, then we'd better hurry. Come on. Well, this is his room in here. I heard the shot... And... When? About an hour ago. But you phoned Hartzell here only 15 minutes ago. I didn't know it was a shot at first. Charlie was supposed to come upstairs. When he didn't, I realized... Well, there he is. Yes. Yes, definitely dead and... Note. Oh, imagine that boy committing suicide. Let's see what the note says. I killed Clark because if he'd been arrested, I would have gone to jail too. But now the police suspect he was murdered and they suspect me. I might as well get it over with before they do. And it's signed, Charlie Melvin. Well, that sort of clears up that, doesn't it? Yes, except for one thing. What's that? Charlie's voice wasn't deep enough. Alexander Graham Bell's little invention should sometimes be strangled. I'm asleep and so should you be. Templer? Yes. Hartzell? Listen, I'm at the Ensign Club on Trocadero. Yes? Uh, I couldn't go home. Charlie's death so soon after Clark's. Anyway, remember that voice you told me about? I remember it very well. I just heard it. What? Uh, the man with the voice like the one you described was here. I'll be right over. Uh, he's gone now, but I, I followed him outside and 
heard him give the cab driver his address. Good boy. I have my car. I'll pick you up immediately. Fine, fine. We can go right after him. It's some distance outside the city. The guy traveled to the North Pole for him. You don't measure miles when chasing phantoms. <laughs> Of course, I, I can't be absolutely sure it's the man you want. Me, I'm grabbing at straws. But his voice did sound like your description. It was at a club to which Clark belonged. I'll make it worth a try. All I need is to hear him say something, anything, a word, a phrase, and I'll know. Oh, that shouldn't be difficult once we get to him. Once we get to him. Only thing worries me is... Uh, yes? That his voice can still be heard by the time we get to him. Halfway to the North Pole. So you didn't take me literally, did you? Uh, you shouldn't be much farther. Uh, Templar. Yes? I don't understand about Charlie. I can't see him murdering Clark somehow. You don't believe he did it? Do you? Not especially. Oh, why not? Well, I don't know. Intuition, maybe. Ooh, our little stranger likes seclusion, doesn't he? Yeah, evidently. You know, uh, the police accepted that suicide note without question. Did they? Uh, there's the house. Oh, there aren't any lights showing. Well, he must have got here sometime before us. I went to bed, I guess. Yeah, probably. I wonder. Do you think he'll recognize you? Oh, probably. I couldn't see him, but he saw me. Well, that might be bad. Uh, are you armed in case he tries anything? No, but we'll manage. Well, suppose he refuses to, to say anything at all. Well, that in itself would answer our question, wouldn't it? We uh, ring? Certainly. Nothing if not courteous. <laughs> it's so... so dark out here. So far from anything. Yeah, dark and lonely. You put it beautifully. He... he doesn't answer. Try the door. Uh, very well. It's open. Good. Then we can walk right in. I can't see a thing. Yeah, wait a minute. I'll light a match. There, the light switch to your left, Hartzell. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Yeah. Oh, that's much better. Now, then. Mm, it's a very charming house you have here, Mr. Hartzell. What did you say? I said you have a very charming house here. My house? Well, you didn't really think I was fooled, did you? That voice you heard in your club was a fiction. It had to be. Our trip here was planned by you so that we'd be alone here. Well, why, why would I want that? The better to kill me, my friend. Kill you, you say? That's what I say. Why, why would I want to kill you? And because, like yourself, I think that suicide note of Charlie's was a fake. Oh, I never said... I did. It is a fake. How did you know? The note ran to the effect that Charlie was committing suicide because the police suspected him of murdering Clark. But the police didn't suspect Clark of being murdered. Well, perhaps not, but you did. Yes, but Charlie didn't know that, Mr. Hartzell. I didn't tell him. I... Oh, very well. Just stay right where you are. Mm, what a handsome revolver. I did kill Charlie. So that there wouldn't be any investigation into Clark's death. I, I, I couldn't afford that. If you kill me, there will be an investigation. No. Because no one knows you came here with me. You're not going to die. You're going to disappear. Oh? In my furnace. I wouldn't like that too warm. I'm afraid your likes can no longer be considered. Well, in that case, I'll have a cigarette. Let me see now, which pocket... Hey, hold on, no, huh? Mr. Hart, who do you want? Oh, my, you dropped your revolver. <laughs> now I have two. You... You said you weren't armed. I'm such a liar. But then, you see, I knew when you asked me why you asked me. So, perhaps I'll be forgiven. Uh, Templar, I killed Charlie, but I didn't kill Clark. I swear I Good didn't. Good heavens, Mr. Hartzell, I never for a moment thought you did. <laughs> A beautiful night time. Mm. Poor Mr. Hartzell, all shut up in a dungeon cell. Yes, I'm afraid the beauties of the night are lost to him. Those beauties are also lost to Charlie and Mr. Clark. Mm, don't be morbid. They're better off dead. Well, it would have been nicer to leave that decision to them. Mr. Hartzell, bless his fussy old soul, was really an impulsive man. And a foolish one. Mm. Let's not talk about him anymore. 
Let's talk. Of your uh, uncle. Why? Because Hartzell didn't kill him. Oh? A man came to me in the middle of the night, in the darkness, so that I never saw him, and told me of a plan to murder Mr. Clark. It was a good plan, absolutely undetectable. The man left. All through this case, I've been looking for a man with a voice like the one that told me of murder. And? There were three people involved. Yourself, who'd get the money if Clark died. Charlie, who'd be saved from jail. Hartzell, who'd be free of embezzlement. Mm. Uncle certainly spread a lot of joy when he died. Charlie was murdered by Hartzell, but Charlie's was not the voice that spoke to me. Nor was Hartzell's. Then whose voice could it possibly have been? Mm, that's the central problem. All right, why did the man come to me in the first place? Well, according to you, to make sure his method of murder would never be detected. But in coming to me, my dear, didn't he make sure of the very opposite? Oh. Well, then he must have wanted you to... That's to... right. That's right. He wanted me to detect murder, but why? Obviously not because he was going to murder anyone. I don't understand. The only voice in this case that I haven't heard is the voice of your uncle. My uncle? He was my visitor. But why? Why did he do it? Because nobody was going to murder him. What could he hope to accomplish? What he did accomplish. And as your uncle was an old man with heart disease on the verge of being arrested for theft, swindling. He knew he wouldn't survive even the shortest prison term. He probably suspected that the strain of the arrest itself might be fatal. And it was. But before he died, he wanted revenge on the lawyer who cheated him and on the secretary who deserted him. So he came to me with his story, figuring that when he died perfectly naturally, murder would be suspected where no murder had taken place. And it worked, didn't it? Because Hartzell killed Charlie. Hartzell himself is going to die for it. Yes. Your uncle must have been quiet. Simon. Yeah? There's a moon. We've talked of unhappy things long enough. Mm-hmm. Got any etching? Mm-hmm. Hey, wait a minute. I thought you didn't have any the last time I asked you. The last time you asked me, my dear, you were a suspect for murder. Now? Now? Now you're beautiful, you're blonde, and... Yes. It's just plain murder. <laughs> Listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, poison doesn't always come in bottles, and it isn't always marked with the skull and crossbones of danger. Poison can take the form of words and phrases and acts, the venom of racial and religious hatred. Here in the United States, perhaps more than ever before, we must learn to recognize the poison of prejudice and to discover the antidote to its dangerous effects. Evidences of racial and religious hatred in our country place a potent weapon in the hands of our enemies, providing them with the ammunition of criticism. Moreover, group hatred menaces the entire fabric of democratic life. As for the antidote, you can fight prejudice, first by recognizing it for what it is, and second by actively accepting or rejecting people on their individual worth, and by speaking up against prejudice and for understanding. Remember, freedom and prejudice can't exist side by side. If you choose freedom, fight prejudice. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at the same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. script of The Saint was written by Louis Vitties. Our cast included Gene Bates, Lou Merrill, Fred Howard, Jack Edwards Jr., and Larry Dobkin. The music was composed and conducted by Vaughn Dexter. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring in RKO's production of His Kind of Woman. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are now on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Programs, get your programs here. Tomorrow night here in Nightbeat, the adventures of newspaper reporter Randy Stone is portrayed by Frank Lovejoy. Listen as Randy works the nightbeat of a newspaper in search of unusual, interesting stories. At Nightbeat tomorrow night, next Sam Spade cuts a caper. Then Zeno Franciscati plays on NBC. 
Welcome back. Well, always fun to hear Louie. One of the really uh, good supporting uh, characters in old-time radio detective programs. Louie doesn't get a, do a whole lot of, uh, in terms of affecting the plot, but it's an opportunity for him to appear and Lawrence Stopkin to uh, be able to collect a paycheck. Also, a great uh, public service message at the end of the episode. Now we're going to flash forward a few years and see how this same concept, also written by Louis Biddies, is handled on Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, starring the great William Gargan. The original air date is uh, May the 12th of 1955, and the title is Visitor at Midnight. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. It never pays to be friendly with murderers. Give them an inch and they'll take a yard, usually rope, tied around your throat and attached to the nearest rafter. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig. Confidential Investigator. Craig speaking. If I try hard, I can remember back to the days before I was in this business, when on going to bed at night, I would always look under my bed. No, not for a blonde, a, a burglar. There never was one, though. So as the years went by, I stopped looking. I just went to bed. On this particular night, however, I had barely dropped off to sleep when I heard a noise at my window. I was practically asleep, and besides, I wasn't in the mood for burglars. The burglar, however, had other ideas. Mr. Craig. I'm asleep. You can't see me, can you? No, uh, and I'd be happier if I couldn't hear you. I can see you, however. It helps me aim the gun I'm pointing at you more accurately. Well, I'd hate to have your aim suffer... Mr. Craig, I need some advice. I'm a novelist. I'm writing a book about murder. I'm calling it The Unsolvable Crime. Well, now that you've got that off your chest... What I came here for was to have you tell me whether or not the murder my book is about is really unsolvable. Well, why me? Because you've had a lot to do with murder, for one thing. Because you're not a policeman, for another. No argument so far. The man to be murdered in my book, that is, has heart disease. He's a crooked broker, a man who deserves to die. Uh-huh. And he suffers from heart disease. For this illness, he takes daily, at stated hours, capsules containing heart medicine. His life depends on these capsules. Now then, the murderer, in my book, that is, decides to poison the broker. Well, that's against the law. Yes. Poisoning, but without poison. Well, get to the next chapter. The murderer steals one of the capsules, pours the medicine out, and replaces the medicine with ordinary water. Eventually, the financier takes the capsule, which contains water instead of medicine. He dies of heart failure. Well, not bad. Thank you. The poisoner can't be traced through the poison he bought because he didn't buy any. An autopsy would show no poison in his victim's body since there wouldn't be any. Most likely, the murdered man would be assumed to have died a natural death. Well? Well, what? Is the crime unsolvable? Well, at the moment, I can't see any flaws in it. Well, if you can't, then I don't imagine the book reviewers will. Don't you mean the police? Why should the police be interested in a book I'm writing? Well, why should the book reviewers be interested in the murder you're committing? You're not serious. You are. Well, I'm afraid I must leave now. No, no, don't move. I still have the gun pointing at you. If I had to shoot you, it wouldn't be an unsolvable crime, perhaps. But what good would that do you? Good night, Mr. Craig. Pleasant dream. The 
gentleman in the dark left quickly and efficiently. So I went back to sleep. When I got up the next morning, I decided to pretend the whole thing hadn't happened. There was nothing I could do, and maybe my midnight visitor had really been a novelist. I cherished that happy thought until breakfast. Uh, your toast, Mr. Craig, in the morning paper. Thank you. Well, you're up early this morning, aren't you? Well, I'm glad you noticed. Uh, any resemblance between this toast and toast is purely coincidental. What does your chef do? Tan the stuff? Hey. I beg your pardon? Very interesting news item here. Halfway down the front page. Take a look. Hmm. James W. Baker, noted broker, dies of heart attack as police prepare to arrest him for embezzlement. A friend of yours? No, no, but he was a crooked broker and he had a bad heart. Well, is that important, Mr. Cray? Uh, it depends on whether he took his medicine in capsules. What depends, sir? Murder. Sure, maybe it was a coincidence. But if it was, it was the kind of coincidence that goes better in books than in reality. James W. Baker was listed in the phone book. So, feeling that maybe the long arm of coincidence had strained a muscle in this particular case, I decided to pay the late Mr. Baker a friendly visit. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is the Baker home, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm Mr. Baker's niece. And you? Barry Craig. Uh, I'm an old friend of your uncle's. You're not old. Well... And you're not a friend of my uncle's. But come in anyway. Thank you. My name is Sandra. I realize maybe I shouldn't have come today. You must be all broken up by your uncle's death. Who? Me? Well, uh, the family. Well, that's me. I'm the family. Your uncle must have been a lonely man. He didn't mind. He had me. And the market. And all those people. He was swindling, of course. And there were Mr. Hanson and Tommy. Who's Tommy? Oh, sort of stunted youth. Uncle's secretary. Very anemic. I always ignore him. And uh, Hanson? Hanson was Uncle's lawyer. And I fondly suspect as big a crook as Uncle was. But very spatted, you know? Spatted? Yes, on the shoes and gardenied in the buttonhole. And, and I have a sneaking suspicion whiskied in the liver. Hmm, sounds nice. Anybody else close to Uncle? No. Then it boils down to one of you three. What does? Uh, who's happy uh, now that Uncle's dead? Well, I am. Hanson is. Tommy is. Well, that just about covers the field. Well, why is everybody so happy? Uncle had some money. I get it now. Hanson stole from Uncle, and he won't go to jail now. Tommy was implicated in Uncle's swindling. Tommy won't go to jail now. And who has a very deep, rasping voice? With the trick of dropping his voice at the end of every sentence. I don't have a very deep voice. Are uh, Hanson and Tommy around? Yes, they are. They're sitting around practicing grief-stricken looks for the funeral. That happy event is this afternoon. I'd better get dressed. Sandra. Hmm. Uh, hurry, 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 hurry. Oh, who's hurrying? I am. Who are you? Barry Craig. And you? Oh, I'm Tommy. I'm Mr. Baker's secretary. Well, in his condition, he doesn't need a secretary. Well, then, I'm Mr. Baker's former secretary. No, no, I'm the former Mr. Baker's secretary. No, I'm... I get it. Relax. Well, I am relaxed. Then why are you in such a hurry? Well, I have to go out to hire some mourners, haven't I? You have to hire some mourners? Well, sure, it wouldn't look nice if there were only three of us at the funeral. No, Especially since you'll all be grinning from ear to ear. Incidentally, uh, has your voice ever been deeper? Heavens, no. Ta-ta. Goodbye. Oh, back again. Oh, no. Hello. Uh, good morning, good morning. I'm in a hurry. Hanson's my name. Well, why are you in such a hurry? Well, you see, my tailor is expecting me. Your tailor? Well, you'd hardly expect me to attend Mr. Baker's funeral in this, would you? Impossible. What are you doing here? Looking for a man with a deep voice. Uh, sorry, mine isn't. Goodbye. Uh, why are you looking for a man with a deep voice? 
Well, he told me how Mr. Baker was going to be murdered. Well, of course, that explains everything. It... What did you say? That's what I said. But Mr. Baker died of heart failure. Well, that's another theory. I like mine better. Dear me. If I only had the time, but my tailor, you know. Uh, goodbye. I stayed in my chair for a while, staring at the door that had shut behind Hanson. Wondering. I'd been handed my three suspects. There was something else, though, that might help, it occurred to me, in a bookstore. And I chose a bookstore in the same neighborhood as Baker's house. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Do you carry medical books? Why, yes, we do. Would you happen to have one on the diseases of the heart? Well, now, we don't stock many. We had one, but we sold it last week. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry. No, it's funny. The person I sold it to was a very nervous gentleman. I, I rather suspected at the time that he might have a heart condition himself. I see. Uh, do you recall his name? Name? Oh, yes. Yes, I remember. It was um, Hanson. That's right, Hanson. Mr. Hanson's taste in literature was interesting. It occurred to me Mr. Hanson himself, if I could pin him down, might be more interesting still. Hello, Mr. Hanson. Oh, Mr. Craig. Come in. Thank you. Well, uh, how did the funeral go this afternoon? Very sad. Very sad indeed. Funerals upset me. Yeah, I can see how that would be. Have you ever tried reading for your nerves? It's supposed to be very soothing. Oh, I'm afraid I have no patience for books. Not even books on heart disease? What was that? Why, I... Excuse me. Hello? Oh. Yes. Yes, of course. At once. Goodbye. Bad news? You turn pale. I'm terribly shocked. Tommy, you know him? Baker's secretary? Yes, I know him. Well, it seems that something's happened to him. What? He's dead. This not only upset Hanson, it set him in motion. The direction was the Baker house. I approved and went along. Hanson, who phoned you? Uh, Sandra. Apparently, she'd been visiting friends, returned home, and found him. Of course, it might have been an accidental death, which would mean another point of for coincidence, but I don't think so. However, if he was murdered... You seem to have murder on your brain. You said something about the police thinking Baker was murdered, too. Not the police. Me. Oh. Oh. Hello. Hello, Miss Sander. Have you notified the police? Yes, I phoned them just a few minutes ago. This is his room. I heard the shots. But when? About an hour ago. You phoned Hanson here only 15 minutes ago. Well, I, I didn't know what it was then. Tommy was going to join me downstairs. When he didn't, I realized it must have been a shot. <sighs> there he is. Yes. Not at all pretty. Definitely dead. There's a note on his desk. A suicide note? Let's see. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. It reads... I killed Baker because if he'd been arrested, I would have gone to jail, too. I thought I got away with it, but the police suspect he was murdered. I can't take it, so excuse the blood. The note signed, Tommy. Well, that sort of clears that up, doesn't it? Yeah, except for one thing. What's that? Tommy's voice wasn't deep enough. Police showed up in a very little while. Tommy's death seemed to be an obvious suicide. I think the police attributed it to insanity. They didn't know what he meant about Baker's having been murdered. As for me, there didn't seem uh, to be much of anything to do at the moment, so I went home and went to bed. This, it would appear, was going to be a case where I didn't sleep. I resisted the impulse to throw the phone out the nearest window and answered it. I'm asleep, and so should you be. Craig. 
Now that you know I'm at home, good night. Wait a minute. Craig, you told Sandra about someone who came to you in the middle of the night and told you about Baker's murder. Yes, I did. You described that voice very carefully. Craig, would you like to hear it again? Very much. Then come down here at once. The Kent Club on Marshall Boulevard, and I can arrange it for you. The man with the voice you described is here. I'd pretty much given up expecting to hear that voice again. But if Hanson said he'd heard it, then it was something for me to find out about. From the time I got the phone call to the time I got to the club, it must have been about a half an hour. Craig, I've been waiting for you. That was the idea, wasn't it? Yes, but that man whose voice I overheard, whose voice resembled the one you told Sandra about. Well? He's gone. Well, that's not so good. You know who the man is? No, but I do know something just as good. What's that? I know where the man went. I heard him tell his cab driver. Len, let's go there. Of course, Craig, you realize that I'm not absolutely sure it's the man you want. Me? I'm grabbing at straws. Anything at the moment is worth trying. That voice did sound like your description. Baker belonged to the club, too. It's a possibility. Hanson, Sandra told me you'd been stealing money from Baker. I don't think I care for that kind of conversation. I'm not making conversation. I'm asking questions. Was she telling the truth? What difference does it make? If Baker was murdered, it might make a lot of difference. You say if Baker was murdered. Aren't you sure? We'll know better, won't we, when we meet this man whose voice you overheard? Yes, we'll know better. The only thing is, suppose something happens to him... Hey, are we still in the United States? We've been traveling for hours. Apparently, he lives farther out than we realized. Shouldn't be much farther. Craig, mind if I ask you something? Go ahead. It's about Tommy. I can see him committing suicide, all right. He never impressed me as being much of anything. But somehow, I can't see him murdering Baker. People rarely kill other people in front of witnesses. That's not what I meant. Craig, are you sure Baker was murdered? No. But you said before... I said I suspected it. That's something else. However, I am sure of one thing. What's that? I'm sure Tommy... Yes? ...was murdered. I was never a Boy Scout, so I don't know very much about direction in the country. But I was surprised at where I wound up. Where the car wound up was a bumpy dirt road and a very secluded hunk of landscape. Well, that must be the house up ahead. Yes, and the house is dark. Probably took him less time to get here. Must have gone to bed. Probably. There's a mailbox. House number on it. Yes, this is it. Well, let's go visit Craig, do you think he'll recognize you? Sure. I couldn't see him, but he saw me clearly enough. That's not so good. Are you armed in case he tries anything? No, but maybe he won't try anything. Suppose he refuses to say anything, to speak at all, when he sees you. That'll answer our question just as well, won't it? I suppose so. Shall I ring? Sure. Well, that would be warning him, though, wouldn't it? Suppose he hears the doorbell, looks out, sees you. He might run away. He might. Look... Why don't I go around to the back? Then in case he tries to run... That's a good idea. You do that. All right. And be careful. Sure. I'll be very careful. The moon picked out the door, glinted on the metal doorbell. I pushed it. It was a nice night. Not too warm, not too cold. However, a guy named Craig was cold. Walking into a dark house with somebody waiting on the other side of the door could have its unpleasant aspects. Nobody answered the doorbell. I hadn't expected anyone to, so I tried the handle. It was very dark inside. I pulled out a book of matches and hesitated. In the darkness, when you strike a match, you make a very nice target. I wasn't sure I liked the idea. On the other hand, I needed a little more action. It would settle things. I lit a match. There was a light switch on the wall, and I flipped it on. 
Then I walked into the parlor. There wasn't much more to the house than that. Parlor, bedroom, kitchen, and that was all. The bedroom door was open and no one was in there. The kitchen door was shut, but no light leaked out from under the door. Offhand, you'd have said nobody was home. And maybe nobody was. So I sat down near the table lamp that was the room's only illumination. Somebody made noises in the kitchen. Could have been mice. It could have been the mystery man with the deep voice, or... It could have been a high wind that was slowly swinging the kitchen door open. I decided, whatever it was, that I didn't want the lamp to glare in its eyes, so... I turned off the lamp and quietly shifted from my position next to the lamp to the other side of the room. That even matters up. It was dark in the kitchen, it was dark in the parlor, and nobody could see anybody. My unlit friend shifted slightly, and I began to get bored. So I grabbed what felt like an ashtray and threw it against the wall on the opposite side of the room. The little stranger didn't like ashtrays. He tried to shoot the one I threw, but the gun flash gave his position away. I know where you are, and my gun's pointing at where you are, so drop yours. It didn't work. I hadn't expected it to, which is why I moved fast after speaking. I figured he still had three more bullets, any one of which hitting me could be painful, so... <laughs> Drop the pop gun, huh? All right. Thanks. We can use a little electricity now. Hello, Hanson. Craig. My, you're bleeding. Your arm? Yes, I... I didn't know it was you. Who'd you think it was? I... Well, I waited outside for a while. Nothing happened, so I came in. And then when you didn't recognize my voice in the dark, you started shooting at me, huh? That, that's right. Thinking I was the owner of this house? Of course. But, Hanson, how could you think that when you yourself own this house? What? But I don't understand. You're not very subtle. When you asked me if I was armed before we got into the house... You said you weren't. Of course. You see, I knew you were going to try to kill me. What? How did you know that? Because you overheard the man with the deep voice. Well, what was wrong with that? You couldn't have heard him. You see, Hanson, the man with the deep voice is dead. The police were glad to get Hanson, especially after I pointed out to them that Tommy's suicide note was a fake. They couldn't have known that, but I did. As I told Sandra, first about the note. You see, it said, the police suspect Baker was murdered, but the police suspected nothing of the sort. You did, though. Yes, but the only one I told was Hanson. And Hanson himself assured me he never spoke to Tommy. Therefore... Hanson killed Tommy after making him write the note? Right. But, Barry, what about the man who spoke to you in the middle of the night? He wasn't Hanson. No. Well, he couldn't have been Tommy. No. Well, then who was he? Sandra, there were three people involved in Baker's possible murder, we thought. You, Hanson, and Tommy. That's so. Well, we were wrong. There were four people involved. Four? Who's the fourth? The murderer. Baker himself. Oh. Then we asked, why did the man come to me in the first place? Well, he said to make sure his method of murdering somebody would never be detected. Yeah, that's what he said. But in coming to me, didn't he make sure of the very opposite? Wasn't he making sure that it would be detected? Oh, Barry, you're very, very brilliant. Oh, wait a minute. Now, Baker knew he was going to jail. He also knew that very probably Hanson would try to murder him. He didn't care very much. He was an old man and a sick one. But he did want to make sure his murderer would be punished. That's funny. What is? If Hanson hadn't tried to make doubly sure he was safe, he probably would be safe. I doubt whether there'd have been enough evidence to convict him of your uncle's murder. But he'll hang for Tommy.
You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Visitor at Midnight, was written by Louis Vitties. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Directed by Andrew C. Love. Our cast included Ken Christie, Kay Stewart, Jack Carroll, Byron Kane, and Jack Crucian. Convicts tell their true life stories on The Loser tonight over most NBC radio stations. Welcome back. Well, an interesting take, and uh, there's a lot noteworthy that was changed, and also that wasn't. There is a sense where the story, to me, sounded just a little bit squeezed, if that makes sense. Like, they were trying to squeeze in uh, details and plot points from the Saint script. And part of that was that the Saint had a 30-minute time slot. At this point, Barry Craig only had 25, so there's some ferocious cutting and kind of pushing back, plus uh, uh, some scenes that were added in later. So uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, pace. One thing that they kept the same that kind of puzzled me was our hero going down to breakfast in a fancy hotel. This is something that suits the saint, but really doesn't quite work for Barry Craig, who, as we hear later, is very much in a rough-and-tumble sort of hard-boiled tradition, and so I kind of didn't uh, buy that. Of course, where the Barry Craig diverges from the saint is really in the ending. The saint walks into the killer's country house, calmly states that he knows his secret, and then pulls the oldest trick in the book in order to get out of trouble. Barry Craig goes creeping around in the house, and there's a gunplay, which reflects the hard-boiled tone of Barry Craig. We also have a divergence in the solutions. In The Saint, the visitor actually died of natural causes and was informing the saint so that he would think it was murder and would, by uh, that assumption, help him gain some revenge from the grave. In Barry Craig, it was because he suspected that he would be murdered. And, in fact, the episode implies that He was murdered, even though Craig isn't able to prove it. In some ways, the Barry Craig solution does make more sense, because if he was going to die of natural causes, even if he thought it would be any day, uh, the financier would have no way of knowing for sure. It might take a week for him to pass away, in which case the saint would not even pay the situation any mind. That he actually thought he was uh, being murdered, but didn't much care about it, but wanted the murderer caught, makes more sense. You can't help but wonder if in the first script, Biddy's had uh, suicide written in, and that was changed for some reason. The other difference is that the saint ends with an implied strong romantic interest between the saint and the niece, while that's completely absent from Barry Craig. Now, there are a couple of possible reasons for that. Uh, First might obviously be just time. You're stretched for time, so you don't have have the ability to spend a whole lot of, uh, of it on the flirty stuff. It's also possible it might be uh, part of where Gargan was as an actor. Though, I don't know how much that would be, as he did in some episodes of both Barry as well as uh, the TV show Martin King, with such scenes of implied romance. 
Well, uh, I guess that's about all. I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, we will hopefully do more of these for future listener support slash appreciation specials. Well, uh, I do want to go ahead now and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Kenny, Patreon supporter since October of 2020, currently supporting us at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for your support, Kenny. And you can join Kenny and more than 250 other Patreon supporters over at patreon.greatdetectives.net for as little as $2 per month. Well, that will do it for today. If you do enjoy this podcast, be sure to rate and review it wherever you get your podcasts from. Join us back here tomorrow for Casey Crime Photographer. Coming up this Thursday, listen for The Adventures of Billy Swift, Boy Detective. And then next Thursday, listen for Philo Vance. And then next Saturday, Tales of the Texas Rangers. In the meantime, though, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.